Hello everyone and welcome to RK Viking. This is the third video in my earliest large-scale conflicts between Native Americans and European colonists in North America series, and the fifth video in my early colonial debacles that disprove the myth of uh, inherent European superiority. The subject of today's video is one that is rather unknown to most people outside of the study of history, and also unknown to a lot of people even in the study of history. For example, I was not aware that these conflicts existed until I started doing research on the this series a few months ago. And that subject is the conflicts between the Native American nations of New England and the Dutch colony of New Netherlands. So, whenever we hear phrases like New England, North America, or the Netherlands, uh, we often think of these countries, regions, and provinces, etc., uh, as how they are now. Like the picture of the United States you see here, um, and also the picture of the Netherlands. After all, these are how we know them in the modern world, which means it's not an, an, an invalid way of thinking about things, because this is how we've known them for centuries, at least between 100 uh, to 120 years or more. But it's also important to remember that this is not the full picture. These countries, provinces, and regions only became the shapes that they are after a long series of processes and events. So therefore, in order, in order to better understand how these countries and regions became the way they are now, we have to go back in time a little bit to get a better look at the bigger picture. Okay, which brings us to the Native American tribes in New England before European colonization. <clears throat> so, uh, before European colonization, and also during uh, the early years of European colonization, uh, in the northeastern woodlands of North America and New England were home to a large amount of very diverse tribal nations like you see here with each of these tribal nations being very similar, but not quite the same, but generally being based around governmental systems uh, that uh, generally have things like great councils and are generally built around the idea of confederacies or leagues, i.e. a lot of uh, allied and closely related nations that work together to form a larger political entity or nation. Um, these Native American nations put things like respect for Mother Nature at the utmost importance, uh, and they were generally, for the most part, uh, matrilineal and matrifocal systems, um, uh, with a matrilineal system being a system where women control property uh, and hereditary status is passed through the matrilineal line as opposed to most of the modern Euro-American and East Asian, really in Asian in general world, uh, where the lineage is uh, passed down through the fathers. For example, we tend to take our father's last name, whereas in a matrilineal system, you would tend to take it, your mother's last name. Uh, and we tend to trace our lineage from our fathers and grandfathers all the way up. Uh, they trace their lineage from mothers and grandmothers all the way up, etc. And then matrifocal systems are when uh, a young married couple, uh, once they get married, they live with the woman's family, which is, of course, the exact opposite of how it is generally done in the Euro-American and Asian systems. Um, generally, of course, there are some exceptions, uh, where you live with the, ma uh, the man's family. 
Uh, also, in the same matrifocal systems, women elders are the ones who approve the selections of chiefs, or as they are more properly called, sachems or sachems. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Uh, and women passed lots of land to their female descendants, regardless of marital status. Again, in stark opposite of how Euro-American and a lot of Asian cultures tend to do where it's passed via the father. And the, the tribes of the eastern woodlands, both north and south, tended to live in large villages, towns, and cities that generally had the makeup, uh, a design and makeup like this. Now, as I've said in the past couple of videos, oftentimes when people hear things like this, they tend to think of when they tend, when they hear the word Native American, they tend to think of uh, teepees and things like that. Um, and this is something that I, as a historian working in museums and archaeology and things like that, uh, as a historian and archaeologist working in museums and archaeology and things like that, I can tell you for a fact that uh, a lot of the general public tends to have that idea that the, that Native Americans only live in teepees. But of course, tribes and the uh, eastern woodlands, as well as in the western woodlands and the southwest. In fact, the great majority of Native American tribes in North America tend to live in some form of village or city, with this being how tribes in the northeast and the eastern woodlands overall would have looked, uh, where they would have lived in uh, essentially sort of log cabin-like buildings uh, called log houses, the long houses uh, that were made of uh, timber and birch bark. And here's one right here. And, and they were agricultural societies where they would have large agricultural farms both within the city and town village limits and outside with the kind of crops that they would utilize being predominantly uh, corn squash and beans, but also they would use controlled fires to uh, shape force uh, to their needs, uh, where they would burn away fire, uh, burn away trees that were uh, easily, uh, could easily catch on fire, uh, in favor of trees that were more fire resistant. Uh, which would lead to the cultivation of fire-resistant trees uh, that would produce things like walnuts, butternuts, uh, acorns, hickory nuts, etc., like you see here. They would also use things like maple sap to make maple syrup, uh, as well as wild rice and blueberries uh, that they could make stews and things out of. And, of course, they hunted. They would hunt a variety of different animals, like deer, bear, uh, fox, rabbit, uh, various different types of waterfowl, like uh, geese or ducks, as well as wild turkeys, etc. They were also very skilled fishermen. Uh, they would utilize water uh, food resources to a high degree. Uh, doing things, utilizing technology such as uh, nets or baskets like you see here, uh, spear fishing, or they would build things called fishing weirs that were either fences or rock walls that were so would sort of shape around like this, where you can sort of see the opening is wider at the front and then narrower at the back, which would keep fish from escaping. So they would swim into the weir but not be able to escape. And the sort of marine resources that they would utilize were things like oysters and clams, uh, lobsters, uh, eels, both freshwater and saltwater, uh, various types of Atlantic fish such as alewife, herring, uh, shad, as well as craw or crayfish, depending on what region you're in. It depends on what they're called. <clears throat> And tribes in the northeastern woodlands and in North America as a whole had access to a very well-developed trade network with some of the trade goods that they had available to them being things like copper, uh, ceremonial pipes, the 
uh, stone that pi the pipes were made out of, which is called ap aptly named pipe stone. <laughs> uh, wampum, uh, well, wampum belts, and also the marine shells to make the wampum belts, uh, which itself was called wampum. Uh, which leads us actually to the Dutch colonization of America. So, uh, in the early 1600s, the Dutch Republic, seeing uh, the inroads into North America uh, being made by their rivals, the British Empire, the French Empire, and the Spanish Empire, the Dutch were, of course, like, well, we want a piece of the pie as well. So the Dutch East India Company was created uh, that eventually made its way to New England where it would create New Netherland with uh, Fort Nassau being the first city area town that they built in 1614 CE, shortly followed 10 years later by their the capital of the New Netherlands called New Amsterdam. Uh, which, of course, would soon be followed by several other forts that, that you see here. Uh, and once establishing this colony uh, and building New Amsterdam in 1624, uh, the colony of New the New Netherlands would steadily grow, starting at only about 350 colonists in 1630 CE, uh, but eventually jumping up to 2,030 colonists in 1640 CE, which is a 408% uh, 480% growth, uh, and then jumping up again to uh, 4,301 colonists in 1650 CE, which is a 111.9% growth, and then finally capping off at about 5,476 colonists in 1660 CE, which is only about a 27.3% growth. But what, why I said that the <clears throat> that the uh, access that Native Americans had to this well-developed trade network lead, leads us into the Dutch colonization of North America is because Pretty much as soon as the Dutch colonized uh, New England, they began to make alliances with Native American tribes, such as the Pequot, so that they could participate in the North American fur trade, which the Pequot were one of the tribes that had a monopoly on. Uh, with the fur trade mainly revolving around uh, furs like uh, beaver fur and things like that, but it could also include uh, bear fur, deer fur, etc., uh, which they would trade, uh, which the Native Americans would trade with uh, European powers like the Dutch in return for uh, gunpowder weapons like flintlock and matchlock muskets, as well as iron tools, whether they be cooking or, say, uh, hooks for hanging things, what have you. And it was a incre an incredibly uh, profitable venture for all parties involved. And you can see there are two major uh, decades um, or time periods of uh, export of, of furs from the New World to, uh, from New Netherland to Europe, uh, with um, the first sort of decade of uh, Large-scale profit based off of this being from 1619 to 1633, and then the next sort of large time period where the uh, Dutch East India Company and New Netherlands profited off of this industry uh, going from 1638 to 1664 CE. Um, I will explain why there was that dip and uh, voyages and uh, exports in a minute. Uh, and then here is a look of a graph explaining the number of private voyages. Uh, of course, this graph is commercial voyages, uh, and this would be private voyages. And you can see it generally maps, uh, maps generally matches the first graph you see here. Uh, and they would ship off like thousands of tons you know, 
uh, hundreds of times, not thousands, sorry, hundreds of tons of furs uh, each year, which you can see here. And again, you can see uh, the large amount of profit here from the 1620s to the 16, mid 1630s, where it dips off again and then picks up again in the 1640s, which again, I'll explain it to a minute, in a, in a minute. But as you can see, this was, they would export quite a lot of furs, therefore making a lot of money. And again, here's that essentially a graph showing the same thing. Um, and again, here's that large profit area from 1620 to 1630, a dip in the mid 1630s, and then another massive spike uh, after the 1640s. Which brings us to why that dip happened in the mid 1630s. And that's because the major trade partner of the Dutch in this uh, North American fur industry, the Pequot would be defeated and dissolved as a political entity, not not exterminated, not extinct, as I explained in the Pequot War video that I will link in the iCard, but dissolved as a political entity. So uh, after the Pequot War that led to the dissolution of the Pequot nation, uh, of course, the fur industry began to see a dramatic dip in exports and fur sales and things like that. Uh, and around that same time period, the go the uh, Dutch governor of New Netherland, Peter Minuit, would leave New Amsterdam to go south to uh, Delaware and New Jersey, or modern-day Delaware and New Jersey, <clears throat> to found New Sweden on behalf of the Swedish Empire in March of 1638 CE. Uh, and then he would been, then be replaced by a man by the name of William Kieft in April of that same year. Immediately after replacing Minuit as governor of New Netherland, Kieft began to... Uh, attempt to implement uh, plans to cut costs um, with him eventually landing on uh, an idea to increase the amount of uh, tribute and goods and such that the Native Americans had to pay uh, in order to get goods that the Native Americans wanted, like guns and things like that, um, which was an incredibly unpopular uh, solution, Be both in the colonists, uh, both among the colonists and the Native Americans. <clears throat> um, understandably so, because for the Native Americans, this had at one point in time been a mutually beneficial agreement. Uh, where both sides got what they wanted, but now Keith was trying to change the deal to where the Dutch got more uh, and the Native Americans got less, which, of course, again, as I said, was not popular among the Native Americans or the colonists. So this plan began to lead to a series of increasing conflicts between the Native Americans of <coughs> of the um, New, Eng of New England and the Dutch, with uh, with these conflicts, including but not being limited to things like pigs being stolen by various uh, Native American war bands, uh, burning of uh, individual colony colonist houses in response to slights or perceived slights, uh, the killing of a Swiss immigrant by the name of Class Sweets, um, among other things. Uh, so, uh, also, the colonists, as I alluded to just a couple of minutes ago, were not happy at all with Keith's so, quote-unquote solution uh, in cost-cutting measures. So colonists began to resist his native his native initiatives. So, uh, <laughs> so Keith actually uh, tr tried to create, well, he did create, he created a, a uh, sort of governmental body called Council of Twelve Men to advise him, with the idea that they would back him and back up his decisions. However, they began to 
sort of pushed back against his rule as well and began to uh, disagree and other things. And so Keith pretty quickly uh, dissolved them. Uh, and this unpopularity amongst the colonists uh, with Swift's, uh, with uh, Keith's, not Swift's, with Keith's uh, uh, cost-cutting measures was because of mainly two issues. One, the Native Americans were far more numerous than the colonists and could easily um, take uh, make uh, make and take uh, reprisals against the lives and property of the colonists. And the the Native Americans were the ones who supplied the furs and pelts that were the economic lifeblood of the colony. After all, the fur industry was incredibly profitable for the uh, for the Netherlands as a whole, as well as the colony of New Netherland. So pissing off the people who own the means of production uh, was not a good idea. But eventually, Keeft would, uh, the, these conflicts would eventually culminate in Keeft sending a punitive expedition to attack a, a Native American village. Um, in fact, the village of the native who supposedly murdered Switz. Uh, but the militia, the militia got lost, uh, and then he accepted peace offerings, and then he launched, la then launched attacks on the refuge of the uh, 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 Wakwaskeek. Apologies if I butchered that. And the Tapan um, in February of uh, 1643 CE, uh, two weeks after dissolving the Council of Twelve, which I talked about uh, just a couple of minutes ago, um, among other things. And this would then shortly be followed by the Pavonia. Yeah, let me sure. Yeah, by the Pavonia massacre, in which Swift's forces, against the wishes of a lot of colonists, including uh, a colonist by the name of De Vries, uh, the militia would go and attack this village and would massacre it, killing, uh, as you can see here in these excerpts, uh, men, women, and children, with rather gruesome details being. Uh, described with like infants being torn from their mother's breasts and things like that, which I will not uh, read in depth, but you can pause to read it here. And all of these would lead to Keith's War. Well, really, Keith's War had already begun, but these would be uh, the beginning of Keith's War. So before we get into the course of the so-called Keith's War, we need to look at the general makeup uh, of the military, both military forces of both sides, uh, as well as their armaments. So what you see here are generally what uh, Wappinger and Lenape uh, Delaware warriors um, Technically, both belong to the Lenape to the to the Lenape Confederation, uh, and this is generally what they would have looked like in terms of how they dressed and their uniforms, military garb, uh, and they would have fought with a variety of weapons uh, up cl for up close hand to hand combat. They would have fought with mace like war clubs or uh, war clubs that were in the sort of the shape of swords that would have either been the war club itself with a uh, sanded off sort of tapered hard wooden edge, or it would have had several church spikes along the edge or several metal spikes along the edge, or maybe one singular spike like you see in this example, uh, making it uh, a very effective and deadly weapon. Uh, they would also fight with bows and arrows because bows and arrows had uh, better firing rates than muskets, were generally more accurate, and while they were not as, quite as powerful, they could still do quite a lot of damage. Um, but it's, of course, as you can see here, they also did use muskets. In fact, the Dutch did supply um, a lot of tribes in the eastern woodlands with uh, the so-called Dutch trade muskets, which were very accurate, uh, very deadly weapons. Which brings us to the Dutch forces themselves. 
Uh, and this is generally what the Dutch soldiers in the 1640s and 50s would have looked like. Uh, and they would have fought with um, a variety of gunpowder weapons, predominantly such as flintlock or matchlock pistols. Uh, of course, the same Dutch trade guns that the Lenape uh, and other Indian tribes of the East Coast used. And then for up-close combat, they would use things like this sort of saber that you see here. So, now let's go on to the course of the war itself. So, as Keith's war began to open up with Keith's raids on the uh, Tapan and Waxek villages, as well as the Pavonia Massacre, uh, the Dutch began to realize, uh, due to the already aforementioned uh, statement about how the Lenape and other Native American tribes outnumbered them to a large degree, they began to realize that they needed that the Dutch needed allies themselves. So the Dutch began to uh, uh, to trade gunpowder weapons in large numbers to more powerful tribal nations than, than the Lenape, such as the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy, specifically the Mohawk, which were the uh, members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy that, that were closest to the Dutch colony of New Netherlands. Uh, and, of course, they would fight predominantly against the Lenape, um, the Delaware, and other uh, members of the Delaware Confederacy or allied tribes of the, of the Delaware Confederacy, such as the uh, Wapinger or the Wapping is uh, the Wapings, like you see here. Uh, and this war did not go very well for for the Dutch. In fact, a large force of about 1,500 Native Americans would invade New Netherland uh, kill and kill many colonists, including an individual that you see here by the name of Anna Hutchinson, who was the chief figure in the antinomian controversy, which ruptured the Massachusetts Bay Colony a few years earlier. Uh, they destroyed villages and farms. Uh, they destroyed the roads and other work of two decades of Dutch settlement, uh, with the Dutch forces succeeding in killing about 400, uh, sorry, 500 uh, Wakasik, uh, uh, Wakwasik, uh, that year in retaliation. Uh, but, of course, the Lenape and other allied tribes have the upper hand, and eventually their raids begin to take a toll, leading to New Amsterdam becoming crowded with refugees, and the colonists becoming even more angry at Keith's rule than they already were. Uh, and they flouted... Uh, he, he actually attempted to increase taxes of the Dutch colonists also, like he had tried to do with the Native Americans, and so they flouted, the Dutch colonists flouted paying the new taxes, and then many actually began to leave the New Netherland back for the Netherlands themselves. So, in response to this, Keith would hire John Underhill, uh, the man, one of the commanders responsible for the Pequot genocide, or the Pequot massacre of Mystic Fort, um, and I, again, I will link the my video on the Pequot War in the iCard, uh, who would then gather a militia uh, and march uh, to kill around 1,000 Native Americans, including five to 700 in what is known as the Pound Ridge Massacre. Uh, this is actually a picture of Underhill and John Mason, uh, his commander, uh, catching up with the Pequot. But this is generally how these massacres would have looked. Uh, but despite that victory, if you can even call it a victory, it was more just like a murder and slaughter, uh, the, at the hands of Underhill, uh, the tribes would uh, continue to harass settlers for the next two years. And in fact, a sparse, the sparse colonial forces essentially became hopeless to stop their attacks, though in contrast, the tribes were also too spread out to mount more effective strikes than they already had. And so eventually, 
A truce was agreed to in August of 1645 CE when the last of the 69 tribes fighting against the Dutch agreed to sign on to the final treaty. And so what were the outcomes of this war? <clears throat> well, uh, Native American attacks, as I mentioned, uh, caused many settlers to return to Europe uh, with the Dutch East India Company losing confidence in its ability to control uh, New Netherland, its colony in the New World. Kieft was recalled to the Netherlands to answer for his conduct, uh, only to die in a shipwreck near Wales. Uh, and then the company would name Peter Stuyvesant as his successor, uh, and he would continue to manage New Netherland until it was ceded to the English. Now we're going to move on to the next conflict between the Dutch and Native Americans, the Peachtree War. <laughs> and this conflict goes back a few years to when the when, when uh, the previous governor of New Netherland, of New Netherland before Keith, Peter Minuit, left to found left New Amsterdam to found New Sweden on behalf of the Swedish Empire. Upon founding New Sweden, uh, the colony of New Sweden and Minuit quickly uh, made an alliance and a an agreement, um, sort of a uh, trade agreement between the New Sweden and the Susquehannock tribe, uh, with the Susquehannock tribe becoming the becoming the main supplier of furs and pelts uh, to uh, New Sweden as well as becoming the main customers for European manufactured goods provided by New Sweden. As well as in the process, New Sweden would actually become a protector and tributary of the Susquehannock tribe, uh, which was, of course, starkly different from New Netherland, where it was a, oh, we're, we're equals. Uh, this was <laughs> New Sweden, at least to some degree, acknowledging that the Susquehannock were the ones really in control which is not something that happened often. It happened very rarely with your other European powers. Uh, but as the as the Dutch already claimed the Delaware River, the Dutch attempted to consolidate their power by combining forces previously previously stationed at Fort uh, Fort uh, Bearers Reed and Fort Nassau, uh, and they would actually relocate uh, a structure from Fort Bearers Reed uh, downstream to the Swedish Fort of Christina, naming it Fort Casimir in 1651 CE. Uh, so, uh, in response to this, uh, the commissioner and counselor to uh, New Sweden's governor, John Prince, uh, Johan, uh, who's the figure here on the left, uh, Johan Rissen, uh, would attempt to expel the Dutch from the Delaware Valley, uh, resulting in Fort Casimir being assaulted, uh, with it eventually surrendering and the, uh, being renamed uh Fort uh, Trafalgar or Fort Trinity, um, leaving the Swedes in complete possession of their colony uh, in 1654 CE. In response to the seizing of Fort Casimir by the Swedes, uh, Fort uh, Trinity, the Dutch would send a squadrons of uh, of ships under uh, under the or uh, sorry the Dutch. Governor Peter Stuyvesant would order a squadron of ships to seize New Sweden in uh, September uh, through September 11th and September 15th of 1655 CE, which you can see that here and here is Peter Stuyvesant. Uh, after the seizing of New Sweden by the Dutch Navy. Uh, the Susquehannocks would, um, who had recently gained dominance over the Lenape, would uh, gather a large army of warriors from multiple allied and neighboring Native American nations, and then uh, 
would descend upon New Amsterdam with 600 warriors who would wreak havoc through the narrow streets of uh, New Amsterdam, which was mostly undefended at the time, as, of course, the bulk of the military was with the Armada uh, taking New Sweden. Uh, and then after the sacking of New Amsterdam by the Susquehannock and allied tribes, which included things like the Esposas and the Mohegans, uh, they would then cross the North River and attack Pavonia, which is modern-day Hoboken and Jersey City, New Jersey, in September 15, uh, 1655 CE, which, as you can see, was right at the same day that the uh, Armada uh, the Dutch Armada had finally successfully seized New Sweden. Which leads us to the course of the war itself. So, uh, of course, a lot of hostages were taken, around 150 were that were held by the Susquehannock and allied tribes at uh, Paulus Hook, modern day Jersey City, and the, the uh, allied warriors would then attack farms at Harlem, Staten Island, and the Bronx, uh, totally causing a widespread destruction. Um, eventually, Stuyvesant, who had actually helped lead the assault on New Sweden, would hurry back to his capital on news of the attack. Uh, afterwards, the ransom settlers would take refuge in New Amsterdam, um, but the settlements on the west shore of the river were completely depopulated. Uh, meanwhile, on Staten Island, 23 Dutch settlers were killed, 67 were captured, uh, and, and 67 were captured by the uh, Hackensack tribe. Uh, in response to this, Captain Adrian uh, Kringen Post, uh, who led the settlement of the colony for Baron Hendrik von der Kappelen, uh, had actually learned the language of the native tribes, and so he would negotiate on behalf of Stupassant and Baron Hendrick for the release of the settlers. Um, and they would eventually, the, the uh, captive settlers would be safely returned in return for uh, ammunition and wampum belts uh, and blankets. The Baron, Baron Hendrick, would then order the 67 settlers to rebuild, to return and build a fort. Uh, but they found their homes burned to the ground, crops destroyed and damaged, and their livestock and horses either set free to roam or killed. Uh, so many of the inhabitants soon moved to Long Island to the Long Island colony. Uh, Post remained with a few settlers to fulfill the Baron's wishes, but he uh, eventually died. Uh, his health uh, not died. His health declined temporarily, and he was not able to complete his goal. Uh, and he eventually moved his family to what became Bergen County, New Jersey, after the British gained control. So that was an incredibly uh, disastrous war for the Dutch. Uh, and so what was the aftermath? Well, uh, Stu uh, Stupassant would repurchase the right to settle the area between the Hudson and the Hackensack Rivers, where he would establish a fortify the fortified hamlets of uh, uh, Bergen, and required blockhouses to be established there and at, at, at other outlying towns, uh, and the colony of Cornelius Milne was abandoned on Staten Island. Now we're going to move on to the last couple of wars between the Native Americans and the Dutch colonists, the Esposas Wars, which uh, went from 1659 to 1663 CE. Yeah. So the Esposas, uh, much like the Waffinger, uh, were one of the many different tribes, several different tribes that were part of the Lenape Confederacy. Uh, and eventually they would engage in a short-lived war between the Dutch and themselves known as the First Esposas War. Uh, and this war broke out because of an incident that occurred where a group of Dutch settlers opened fire on a group of Esposas around a campfire. Um, this group had been celebrating with brandy, given as payment for farm work. In response to this, the Esposas would raid and destroy many Dutch settlements, uh, kill 
large numbers of livestock and would burn down large numbers of Dutch buildings, as well as the Dutch war party would later also besiege the walled city of Wiltwick. Uh, where uh, though where the Dutch were actually able to hold out, uh, even though they're outnumbered, due to the fact that they received uh, reinforcements from New Amsterdam. Uh, but the Esposas generally held the upper hand through this very short-lived war, with the war concluding uh, essentially in a draw, where the Esposas would agree to trade land in return for food on July 15th of 1660 CE. But this in itself would be a very short-lived peace, because the Second Esposas War would break out in 1663 CE. So while peace had been concluded uh, between the Esposas and the uh, Dutch settlers, uh, tensions remained between the Esposas and the settlers, and eventually uh, the Esposas would, the, these tensions would eventually lead the Esposas to tricking the Dutch colonists of uh, Wilfwick uh, into keeping the gates open, resulting in uh, Esposas warriors rushing in and sacking the city on June 5th of 1663. Uh, here's an excerpt the, of uh, the Journal of the Second Esposas War that you can pause and read. Uh, and then, after several inconclusive raids by the Dutch in response to the sacking of Wiltwick, uh, the Dutch would gain much needed help from the, their allies, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Mohawk specifically. So after receiving re uh, these reinforcements from um, the, uh, New Netherland, as well as uh, Mo from the Mohawk, uh, Dutch forces and uh, Dutch and Mohawk forces would march on the explosive stronghold in the mountains uh, to the north, uh, burning the surrounding fields in the hope of starving them out and eventually defeating the Esposas in a battle that resulted in uh, the chief or Sachem, Sachem uh, Papa Quanchen, uh, and several other Esposas readers, leaders dying. And here's an excerpt from, again, from the uh, Journal of the Second Esposas War that you can read about that event. Which brings us to the aftermath of all of the wars between the Dutch and the Native Americans of New England. So after these wars, Dutch sailors became suspicious of all Native Americans that they came to contact with, even their allies, the Mohawk. Uh, though there were some benefits uh, for the Dutch uh, after these wars, as colonial prisoners taken captive by Native Americans during these wars, such as the Second Esposas War, were transported through regions that they had not yet explored, and after describing these regions to colonial authorities, colonial authorities would then send out people to survey it, which eventually led to some of this land being sold to French Huguenot refugees who would establish the new village, uh, the village of New Paltz. In September of 1664, the Dutch would actually cede New Netherland to the English, with the English shortly after redrawing the boundaries of Native American territory, after which they would pay for the land that they planned to settle, forbid, and forbid any further settlement on established Native lands without full payment and mutual agreement. Uh, they would then pass a new treaty that established safe passage for both settlers and Native Americans for uh, purposes of trading, and it further declared that all past injuries are buried and forgotten on both sides, uh, and the <clears throat> British promised equal punishment for both settlers and Natives found guilty of murder and paid traditional respect to Sachems or Satans and their people. Uh, but over, over the course of the next two decades, Esposas lands were bought up, and natives uh, like the Esposas uh, would move out peacefully, eventually taking refuge with the Mohawks of the Shawgunk Mountains, though, of course, some tribes like the Lenape um, did not leave necessarily peacefully. And here is a 
uh, picture of that treaty, and here are the Shagak Mountains. Now that leads us to the last section of the video. The Were these tribes today, the Lenape, the Wappinger, uh, and the Susquehannock? Well, the Lenape uh, still exist as a political entity, uh, as you can see here, and their culture this is alive despite uh, multiple attempts by uh, European colonists and continued to this day attempts by the U.S. government to uh, erase their culture. With the Lenape having nations in both Oklahoma in the form of the federally recognized Delaware tribe of western Oklahoma, and in Delaware and Pennsylvania itself, uh, and New York itself, in the form of the Lenape tribe of Delaware and Pennsylvania. The Wappinger exists today. Uh, as part of the, Mohe uh, the Mohican Stockbridge Mutsi Band, as you can see here, with their uh, tribal nations being uh, in around the area of modern day uh, Wisconsin. The Susquehannock, however, have for the most part, disappeared as a political entity. Um, they have not gone extinct themselves, but in terms of being a political a political entity, uh, they are no longer a nation. Uh, but their descendants continue to live on in other tribal nations, such as the Seneca Cayuga tribe of Oklahoma. And you can see that over here in the top right corner. All right, so that ends our video on the conflicts between the Dutch colony of New Netherland and the Native American tribes of New England, primarily the Lenape and Lenape related tribes like the Wappinger uh, and the Susquehannock, uh, which ends our third video on early conflicts or early large-scale conflicts between Native Americans and European colonists in North America and the fifth video in the, uh, the early colonial debacles that just proved the inherent superiority of Europeans which as you kids saw in this video this definitely fits that <laughs> categorization. All right so if you want me to cover any of the other subjects I mentioned in the video in later videos, uh, please feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. I hope you enjoyed the video and remember to like, share, and subscribe and have a good day.